those rotten thrones have messed it all up. It was my partner who recommended I do another cartoon game review, and I don't mean partner as in significant other, I do mean partner as in a co-host of another show I do, Wayne's World! Colm, or as I prefer to call him Kilroy, You're a civil servant, but it burns when you do wee wee. <laughs> has destroyed our friendship because of this, even though he really wanted me to review a wacky racers game. Although, taking the piss out of Mainly Good Mate at work puts me at blame as well, to an extent. Hey, he started it! Look, 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 let's never mind this playtime banter bollocks. It's high time I played the waste of time, money and patience that is Scooby-Doo and Looney Tunes Cartoon Universe Adventure. Well, I'd rather die! Fine, that's enough of that! Or as I prefer to call it, what on God's green ass was the point of this? For starters, the marketing for the game absolutely sucks. Take the name, for example. It's no wonder I keep accidentally calling it Scooby Tunes, which works far better anyway. If it's about Scooby Doo and or Looney Tunes, it's obviously going to take place in their retrospective cartoon universes. And while the game's total garbage, I have to agree that it's an adventure, and not just in the writing, but for the player. No, no, actually, no. A better term that Cullum came up with was experience. Like Garfield Kart, this isn't so much a game as an experience. It's not as galling to sit through as Garfield Kart, but at least Garfield Kart had the right name. Or Garmfeld Kark, as players have taken to now. Then there's the cover art. Those characters only appear in cutscenes and Roadrunner doesn't make the slightest cameo. In fact, that right there covers the entire theme for the game. Everything is a cameo. On Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck's 25th birthday, the two receive Mock Me brand gifts, a competitor and far more evil version of Acme. Yes, even more villain than falling anvils and dynamite. On their quest to find out why they sort of ripped off Citizen Toxie the Toxic Avenger Part 4, they come across a few other badly voice acted characters in the Looney Tunes universe. They only appear in cutscenes, as said earlier, somehow teleporting themselves through the magic of hack writing from one plot point to the other. For some reason, Foghorn Leghorn is a corporate director of Acme. Yozamaji Sam is a health inspector. Yeah, the guy who indiscriminately murders saloon ceilings is in charge of responsible use of industrial machinery. Speedy Gonzalez and Juanita introduced you to the cheese mines because of course they fucking do, and Wiley e. Coyote has the voice of a rejected Crash Bandicoot villain. Permit me to introduce myself. My name is Coyote. Wiley e. Coyote. None of the famous rivalries play a role here, even though the Roadrunner is on the cover art and is nowhere to be seen in game, probably retaining a shred of dignity unlike the rest of the cast. As for the Scooby Doo side of things, they're slightly less miserable. The characters do appear in the levels, and that's the only improvement. Even then, they're not much good seeing as they just stand there looking pretty. That is, if you call a two second animation and not reacting to ghosts pretty. More like pretty rubbish. In both cartoon universes, or part of the same universe, wait, just hang on a darn nostril picking minute. If this game boasts to be set in the same cartoon universe, how come Scooby Doo and crew don't interact at all with the Looney Tunes Looney Tunes? That's usually what happens when you say it's a universe or crossover like Marvel vs. Capcom or Crash Purple or John Bon Nitro Kart. I guess the dev's excuse is that because you play as the same character in both games, kind of, the two are somehow related. To the three of you who still give a damn about my thoughts on this dreck, you might be asking yourself who the main character is. Why, it's none other than Agent 47. You just ate a tin of curry powder and painted your face green. <laughs> It was a hoax because the paint washed off when that enema backfired. <laughs> Entertainment. He's such a master of disguise that people can't see he's an animal underneath, and even those with the most keen senses can't tell if he's a bird, a horse, a cat, or a dog. The character customization is decent enough, giving you the chance to make sets or mix and match. If you're as creative as me, you might be able to top my favourite creations, such as Nitrous Oxide and Noddy Holder.
However, it comes at a cost. Coins on the level are used to buy the wearable tat, or alternatively you can find poorly concealed clothes in the world. There's a catch with the latter though, you don't know what it is until you get it, which is pants. Or it could be a shirt. At first, the rate at which you get coins is fairly slow, but it speeds up as the levels get longer and a bit cleverer. If you've even made it that far, and why would you? However, and that's a word I really need some synonyms for, the rush of silver, gold and platinum isn't much of a motivator to continue playing. Well, it kinda is for someone like me who will play anything that faintly looks like Spyro the Dragon. All hail Slanesh! All hail the Amethyst Drake! <laughs> Fine, that's enough of that twat! You can also spend your coins on upgrades such as half damage from enemy attacks, increased run and jump speed, plus some other useless toss I fail to remember. While these sound helpful and make the already well-paced game a tad faster, they can lead to your death as they're sometimes hard to keep under control. God, you think this is Wrath of Cortex? Hang on, come to think of it, this could actually be better. No shitty vehicle stages, no aggravating load times, and no furious masturbation because it's jealous of Crash Bandicoot 3's success! It's just like Cortex Strikes Back, which makes it Game of the Year. Uh, which year? I don't know, I stopped paying attention to what I was saying ages ago. So anyway, back to John Bond Nitro Kart. The player is armed with one attack which is fine for nearly all enemies, but the Umbrella, Mallet and Anvil Summoner add some extra punch and can clear secret paths. Not only do they succeed in doing what you could already, but two of the items have an alternative slower ranged attack, whereas the umbrella lets you glide. I'm sure you can appreciate why I use the umbrella so much, especially when washing up baskets filled with child-friendly Gwar outfits can only be reached with the brolly. You know, it's a bit like Spyro the Dragon in that regard. At first the levels are quite flat, threatening to have multiple layers for further exploration, and then later on the levels live up to this potential right before becoming the definition of insanity. Here they... well, they just get more involving. At first, the stages are flat with very little platforming challenge. Most of the threats come from the mock me machines like... Um, a toaster that throws dynamite and a cheese grater. Yeah. <laughs> The enemies and bosses remain the same throughout, but at least the map designers show more imagination. Or a bigger budget. The puzzles are minimal and there's very little backtracking until much later, making for a very laid-back experience. Only without the satisfaction of a buzzing dragonfly picking up the pieces of Avalar's terrible economy. But as for the aesthetics, they're nothing short of scooby doody The mall is the best location, using a lot of original assets and has the most work put into it, but everywhere else is as pleasant to look at as... Well, the places in th this game. Well, that was shit! Running and jumping are a platform game as bread and butter. But I don't like butter, so I'll change that to Marmite. And enemies are the knife that spread the Marmite, and the PC is the plate it's served on. Or a paper towel if you don't fancy washing up. Look, I was just trying to say that the enemies are as dull as dishwater. Sure, they can pick off a fair chunk of health, but the moment you die or crack open a container, you'll find enough health pickups to fully replenish your little green bar. Health pickups come in the form of yucky, healthy fruit, so the mock me machines don't seem half as threatening. Hey, I played DK64. I've seen the effects of fruit on the body. Anyway, the enemies don't chase you or have any decent pathfinding, instead preferring to patrol or walk in a line and mostly rely on you bumping into them. That's nothing at all like Spyro the Dragon, where enemies were stationary and... Uh, ...reacted too slowly. But that's better because it's Spyro! I tell a lie, some of them chased you for a bit, and they had the advantage of psychological warfare. I drink... To forget Jake's. I'll never forget the atrocities at Twilight Harbor. They they had machine guns! Norks with machine guns! The Scooby-Doo levels have even worse foes, if you could imagine. There's skulls that hop around in a circle, so nothing new there, and then there's ghostly cannon people who fire a slow projectile periodically. It's cool that they have stealth, but it's meaningless when you don't stick around the enemy long enough to be affected by them. Oh, and they don't die. 
Finally, a word on the bosses. The Looney Tunes ones are almost identical, being a big machine that works like one fifth of Crash Bandicoot bosses. Ripperoo, Tiny Tiger, Nefarious Trope, Neo Cortex, and Crash Bandicoot 3, and the Muck Monster from Muppet Monster Adventure. Basically, don't step in certain places, walk up to them, and smack them in the chops. And yes, that also applies to the final boss. The ending's not up to scratch either. The Scooby-Doo bosses are more clever with puzzles, but are little more than a child's playground rendition of their own made-up scenario. There's none of the cleverness or manipulation from the TV show, just convenience. It just so happens that the boss is under the net we set up, and it just so happens we've enough items nearby to stop them getting away. And besides falling down bottomless pits, there's no threat. If you needed evidence that a good game takes time to make, look no further than the barren unwillingness to go any further that is this game. I forgot the full title, like was it Scooby Tunes or something? Oh fuck. Hey, Like Garmfeld Kark, my previous review, I describe the visuals as uninspired and cheap looking, but with both I have to admire the colour palette. All self-respecting children and man-children love flashy colours and they're almost enough to make you forget just how hollow Cartoon Universe adventure is. It's a shame then that everything else is lazy with poor AA and little in the way of shadows, especially the latter, which was recognised as a key element to the humour in the animated shows. And the repeated textures and assets don't help the general okay graphical fidelity. Yeah, okay for a PS2 game, but it's on PC and 3DS. As for the soundtrack, it's not Looney Tunes Racing, or Sheepdog and Wolf, or Back in Action, or Lost in Time. Not sure what else there is to say on that, really. Oh, sweet child of mine, ever since I've reviewed Neon Drive, I've not been able to talk about sound design in video games. <laughs> Scooby-Doo and Looney Tunes and Sonic and Ted Rogers. All Stars transformed bottom all cartoon universe Sega racing adventure guest starring Ted Rogers isn't very good. It's not a technical nightmare or a microtransaction ladle landfill, but quite simply a video game. A very simple, boring and easy platform game that makes no attempts to justify your time or monetary investment. The story is flat, the characters have none of their iconic personalities or voices, and the gameplay is repetitive. There is a purpose to the glut of collectibles as opposed to the best platform game ever, but there's not much incentive to chase after the coins if the rest of the game isn't very good. For a casual time waster, £14.99 is too much. It's three hours of dragged out basic platforming, with levels you get sick of quickly and you don't have a climax worth trying to reach. Not to mention there's no achievements or trading cards, which is the only thing that would make me return to this grey, monotone sludge. But I did like the idea of another Looney Tunes game, and one with custom characters. Kinda like that old Disney game, Toontown I think it was. God, you remember that? I hope that's still going, because I want to play that now. Better than this wank! With more challenge, better voice acting, more effort put into bosses and different scenery, I can see Mock Me and Something Beard being antagonists I'd like to stop. The best way I can describe this game is tacky. People worked on this, it exists, and those people think this is worth real money. I disagree. I could have saved you a lot of time by putting that at the beginning. Oh, bollocks! Uh -huh.